The road to space isn't paved with technology and rockets alone. It's built on the dreams, risk, and relentless spirit of those who dare look up and say, we belong there. For over 30 years, the Space Frontier Foundation has been a home for these visionary, radical, action-oriented individuals. Hear their stories, learn how space was shaped, and revel in the revolution of commercial space pioneers. Lori, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, to share some of the stories that are very much related to the work that was done by the Space Frontier Foundation. Um, if anyone's not already familiar with Lori, go read the book. Yeah, pause this, come back. That'll give you a, a fairly good idea about what Lori has already done. What I really love is to go maybe some of those things are a little it's a step deeper and what led up to some of the really crucial inflection points and decision points that you had and that you saw the industry having during that that period uh we're talking after l5 society after moon treaty but still still well before we got to the fulfillment of what currently exists in, in commercial space. Where, if, if we go backward in time, uh, looking at kind of where things were in the late 80s, what, what time did you start getting some ideas that there was a different type of architecture that might work for space? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be with you. And I would say before the late 80s in my own involvement began when I joined the National Space Institute as an entry level staff person in 1984. And there was early discussion of a merger with this organization called the L5 Society at the time. And those discussions took two years and while they were taking place, I was not involved in them at all. This is receptionist, bookkeeper, secretary. That was the job uh, I held in those early days. Um, and the National Space Institute was founded in 1974 by Dr. Werner Braun, a very, very tied to industry and uh, hierarchical board structure. So for me, as you can imagine, this was just very early in my career out of college that the L5 Society merger loomed large because it was going to be an influx of new people. And that's a fantastic thing. We only had four staff. They only had three staff. And uh, so I was really excited to, about the merger and um, hearing from the National Space Institute side what they wanted out of it and then getting to know the L5 Society and recognizing we were going to be marrying the grassroots energy of L5 with hopefully the economic financial support of the industry was the concept. And my early memories of understanding beyond what just NASA was doing, which was what NSI supported, um, were from people like Gary Hudson, who I started going to International Space Development Conferences in those years before even the merger. And I had a background in political science and economics. So a lot of this was to me the economic arguments of lowering the cost of space transportation and settling space that was something that Gerard O'Neill had first written about spoken about, taught, and all those early studies that were done made sense to me. And it was the L5 leadership who just through um, getting to know them, it became clear to me that yes, they were passionate, but their views were also very well founded and they made complete sense to me from the beginning. And what I couldn't really understand and started to question early was why was this very small nonprofit organization the one driving these very thoughtful ideas when you know, I'd gotten to know people very well at NASA. I played on the NASA softball team. 
it, it just wasn't something they embraced. These were shuttle years. These were, these were people who felt flying, you know, six to seven shuttles a year was fantastic. Do, do the thing. Yeah. So this is, this is phenomenal. So you had the NSI direct experience and then we're seeing this L5. And when you, as with that political and economic lens, how how many counterparts did you feel that there were, like when you would show up at ISDC or some of these conferences, were there other people that were taking that economic approach or was it a lot more technical sort of discussions and, and thinking about great technical solutions? One of the things about the L5 leadership that uh, I, I think was brilliant was it was always married with the practical economic considerations, at least from the leadership that I work most closely with. It wasn't just the technical. Yeah, there was very early talk of things like nanotechnology and the things like the space elevator that would ultimately really advance the time when there there could be true the space-faring civilization, which ended up being something we we used in our mission statement. But no, it was it was, and I credit Dr. O'Neill because that that was part of their development as well. That really and, and somewhat this idea of always being able to not test or strain the limited resources of Earth but to tap those from beyond that was always just again so sensible <laughs> of course it's long term of course but what so, else was the space program really doing besides those practical economic things communication satellites were already a thing gps was starting um, remote sensing was starting and human space flight was just these shuttles and that was not going to create a space civilization very clearly. Okay, so that's the space life at that time. What was your non-space life like, if there was any? I know because space can kind of suck us in and become everything. But do you remember talking to friends outside the industry or family members and trying to explain this commercial appeal of space to people that weren't actually in the industry? Well, that is a question I don't usually get asked. It's, that's a great one. And it gets to a point I like to make, which is this really wasn't very controversial in the beginning. It was like not. My, my father was a stockbroker. My family were farmers. They were in politics as Republicans in Michigan, you know, farmers who were doing that, serving their neighbors. And so everything needed to be underpinned in sound policy that helped your taxpayer and uh, expand, you know, the economic sphere. I doubt we called it that back then. But we really, over over time, I, I think it got more controversial later, maybe because people in the space industry started taking us seriously. But as I would convey as a 20 something, two friends and family, not in the space community, sort of this is our interest. I, I, I feel like it wasn't super controversial. Again, you are using logic to say transportation costs have to come down. And when they do, that opens up these new territories as they have here on earth. And that's a new frontier. And, you know, it was an exciting time when the, in the beginning, when people thought the shuttle might be going as it was designed to, you know, 52 times a year, once a week, it became clear to those of us paying attention that wasn't ever going to happen. But space is inherently interesting to people. And I don't feel I got a lot of pushback. I have looked back, especially researching the book, at testimony I made before Congress in the 80s and 90s. We had a policy committee and, and much of what we said is what I ended up being able to start putting in place 30 years later. Unbelievable that it took that long. But these, these yeah. are things, again, that I believe became more controversial when they started really threatening existing ways of doing business. The truth is in the 90s, we were doing the X-33 program. We had DCX. There were people focused on it. The head of NASA from 1992 
to 2001, Dan Golden was all aboard this. I took him to Space Frontier Foundation yep. meetings. We had the Space Settlement Act in 1988. These these are concepts. And again, driving my interest in writing the book was for people to understand this didn't start with SpaceX and Elon Musk. And frankly, none of that would have been successful without the early work of the L5 Society and the Space Frontier Foundation and, and people who've been tilling in those fields for decades. Of course, we needed SpaceX and lots of companies and people had run at this and not been successful. But what I say in the book is we we left the breadcrumbs and it took SpaceX to follow them to start making it happen. Do you think so if it wasn't necessarily controversial, then there's some enthusiasm about space because there's always enthusiasm about space. But was it not as difficult a task back then because it seemed like it was the logical thing? There, there are some people now that feel like work in space is doubly hard because there's the technical and then there's the the business or like working against a established machine that has high barriers. But at that time, like if you could have predicted, when would you have said that there would be commercial companies providing access to space? Do you have any idea of what that guess might have been? I, I think I would have guessed at least 10 years before that actually happened. I would have guessed by 2010 because we were really excited about the X-33 program. Yeah. We, you know, you can look at any number of decisions along the way. Uh, you'd need a much longer program to do that, even just for this program alone, because a lot of folks feel that DCX, had it been selected, could have continued. But there was the overall global economy, not unlike the position we're in today, where when the sort of dot-com bubble burst in 2000, it killed the market pull of lowering yep. the launch costs. Private industry didn't want to invest when there wasn't going to be these multiple constellations of hundreds of satellites. Now we have multiple constellations of thousands of satellites, and that is helping to drive launch costs down. Again, if you think about this economically, it makes sense, but we really thought we might get there through the X-33 program. Single stage, fully reusable to orbit in the 90s was just too big. Look, even Starship isn't a single stage. Yep. So Venture Star, Lockheed gets a lot of criticism. NASA gets criticism for having selected it. But I'll tell you what, it was, we came closer than I think most people think. Had they chosen DCX again, it might have worked. X-33, when they blew the tank on that accident, I think it was 90, 1999, we could have recovered that with not much investment. NASA was spending $8 billion, one billion dollars and Lockheed was matching that so since then it's multiple billions for everything oh, yeah. um if we would have just spent a couple hundred million more we might have been on a path or if we had backed off and said how about two stage how about not single stage now did the shuttle mafia come in and say you know what let's literally bury this because that's what they did with the venture star they buried it in Palmdale because they didn't want it being resurrected again, which might tell you something. They they liked their four to five billion a year in contracts to fly the shuttle a few times. Imagine that. And it yep. wasn't until they had another accident that they stopped the battle to not have a replacement. But the real tragedy, there's so many, of not having anything set up to replace the shuttle. When I came into NASA a second time in 2008 and nine, those seeds were planted years before. How did you, as someone who believed in a commercial, like the correct path rationally, economically, and maybe maybe politically, was a commercial service. When the setbacks to that future started to impose themselves on your worldview, how did you grapple with that dose of... I don't know if it's even dose, dose of reality, a dose of a sit, set of situations that kind of would rock the foundation of your assumptions. Well, you know, I, I probably more often than any other question get how did you keep going when it seemed like everyone 
was opposed, including, you know, my boss, Charlie Bolden, the head of NASA and so forth, industry, the Hill, I'm being maligned, I'm being criticized for ruining and trying to ruin the future of human spaceflight by Apollo astronauts and so forth. And, and the answer is the same as these decades earlier lessons that I had learned from the people who came before. I just, I knew it was right. I knew it was correct. And so no amount of just delay was going to help. That was going to make it worse. The people fighting these advancements were the real ones holding back progress in our space program. And I knew that ultimately that would become um, known. It just, I mean, it's just inevitable. You aren't going to continue to get the amounts of taxpayer dollars to send a handful of astronauts into space when there are ways to get there for less. And it just took longer than we hoped. And setting up the policies to make that happen, those ideas had come decades before as well. Doing things that we ended up you know, using successfully, like advanced purchase agreements called the Manker Tendency, doing demonstration missions for technologies. Those were tried and true methods that we knew were the best path. So I didn't react as well as I could have. And I also get asked a lot, would you do things differently? Of course, yeah. I'm not, in my view, a thin-skinned person, and I don't try you know I, I tried not to be but it was pretty frustrating and at times i let that show part of that is also strategy like are you kidding me i'd be talking to astronauts are you kidding me like this isn't about your single flight this is about a bigger movement and a bigger purpose and our space program is at its best when it has a larger purpose it did in apollo and that's why we attracted the attention of the world and the funds and we had lost a purpose and what i have always appreciated about the movement and the space frontier foundation really um, embodies this is the greater purpose and as a political science and economics person that's the that's what government investment is for it's not for a couple people to take joy rides and be on orbit and say, I'm having so much fun. Oh, how nice of you. Yeah. If again, if you had a time machine and you could go back and speak to one of your younger selves and said, okay, in the future, there will the two superpowers, one of them will be selling commercial seats to access space, and the other one won't have the ability to put humans in space. Would you or anyone at the time have bet on? the actual way that played out? Like, was that even a concept? Like with the collapse of the Soviet Union, like, was that something that had even crossed your minds? Or when did it cross your mind that this was a, a threat? You know, the collapse of the Soviet Union is, uh, again, so, so many things evolved from that. And in the late 80s, when some of these space development concepts were being formed, that's, this is why folks went to Russia and things like Mircorp. I, I myself trained in Russia through Mircorp to go to space on a Soyuz. So pretty early on, I probably would have guessed that this would be the case. Knowing the NASA and aerospace folks as I did working closely with them, being friends with them didn't, didn't really make you think, oh, these are groups of people that really care about the bigger picture and getting the costs down. It, it continues to be a community that is largely based on um, their own financial security and advancement. And that's not a winner over the long term. <laughs> and I was so impressed the first time I went to Russia. I went when I was at NASA in the 1990s at what they were able to accomplish with so little. And you just it's just overwhelming what they had been able to do. So being at so NASA when you should embrace that program was exciting. And, and of course, these last few years have been very disheartening to see them take a, yeah. their steps toward back to totalitarianism. And we really, I think, in the space program are trying to hang on to the space leadership that they held for so many years, but it is waning. So that scarcity in the you know former 
Soviet countries was in some ways a driver of innovation. They had to come up with things, whereas our well-funded U.S. groups didn't have the same driving condition from a... Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a little more complicated, but, you know, their tech, <laughs> for instance, was just um, robust. And yep. so instead of, at least if you separate out their little hiatus into the brawn and so forth, um, the Soyuz worked so well through brute force and re repetition. And of course, a labor force that isn't making a living wage. So right. these are not sustainable no. either um, or something that we should be emulating. And I would say we should be careful that our space startups don't believe that they can live forever on ramen either. But that's a <laughs> like, some lessons we should carry, um, both good and bad. So. So you talked about withstanding criticism and attack. Were there times where it wasn't person versus person, but just you versus the universe, where things just didn't seem to be going the way that your mental model of the world was, and, and you actually thought about cashing in and going and doing something else with your life? Because I will tell you, I face that existential crisis in this industry, and I know other people do as well. I'm not. If you didn't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't have to make it up. But like, were there, were there times of like, yeah, this might be the right answer, but I still don't know if I can be the one to keep doing it. Well, I did end up leaving NASA in 2013, and that certainly had something to do with it. But before that, I, I really did not ever feel like giving in. It felt like. We always had a team of people. Again, I came from the community that stood with me the entire time. And I always tried to make it out to the Space Frontier Foundation and NSS conferences and so forth, because I would say, you know, you give me strength. But within the Beltway, the big lobbyists, the astronauts, most of NASA's leadership, they were they were vehemently opposed and took a, you know, tried to attack me personally. I share some of this in the book. I hadn't put it in the book. And my deputy said when she read it, he didn't put it in the dog poop. Don't you remember someone sent you dog shit once? I'm like, oh, I blocked that. Um, <sighs> it's, it's just like unbelievable. But in a, in a weird way, it was empowering. You know, I didn't grow up thinking I was going to be deputy of NASA. I came to this in a very strange background way. As I said, receptionist, secretary, bookkeeper at the Space Society, you wouldn't necessarily think that would that would happen and without a science or engineering background. But other than the times I, I had children at home at, at the time and I I was scared. I did get death threats and I remember not wanting to be near the front of the house at night with open you know window shades and so forth and the kids to be protected that that's not a good feeling but it sure didn't make me want to quit it I, really didn't it's right. just not in my personality leaving for me was somewhat about i've run this as far as it's going to be helpful for for the program and other people can take it farther because I had become, you know, a negative, a lightning rod. And certainly it, I wasn't looking for a job. A headhunter reached out to me and said, people really want to recruit you because they are wanting a game changer and they see this. And I, you know, working for somebody who really doesn't agree with you um, is tough. And I wanted the yeah. Obama administration to be stronger. They did agree with me. But there are there's so much on the plate of a president. Again, this is something I tried to describe in the book. I really just didn't get, I think, once they made the wonderful decision to run at this policy, they just weren't willing to stand behind it with the political trade-offs that they yeah. needed to. They they folded, I say in the book. We had, in my view, uh, Royal Flush, they had a pair of twos, and we walked away from the table. I mean... Why would you do that? But we did it because we needed the votes on health care and because Bill Nelson got up every day and still does probably thinking about space and what he wants to do. And he had decided 
he needed to make an agreement with the Republicans to do the big rocket to get Senator Shelby and Senator Hutchinson on board and do Orion. And that was the deal he wanted to make. And he was in a more powerful position than me. So, okay. So that's definitely dark. I'm going to pull us maybe a little bit up out of that. And the community that was supporting you, maybe can you give a little bit more of a context of what did that actually mean? So for someone, so for people that are brand new in the industry, they may not quite know what that community is. And even some of us that were not there then, but have come in afterwards, we've got different ideas of what community, what was that community? You mentioned the conferences, but what, how did that express itself? What was the actual communication between you and other members of the community? So part of it is coming from organizations, and in my case, the National Space Society, formerly L5 and NSI, where there were 30,000 members and very smart leaders who I knew had recognized and taught me this was the only path, this was the very best path to creating a spacefaring civilization. And the whole point of exploring space beyond its immediate uses for us here on Earth is the spacefaring survival going beyond our single planet. And these are concepts that I believe to my core because of the community. But in the practical day-to-day -day sense, it, it is having people to go out to dinner and drinks with at night and can conspire about which members of Congress we need to get to. I call them my kitchen cabinet. At this point, the Commercial Space Flight Federation were some of my closest allies and part of that community. We would strategize uh, because I didn't have my NASA team that was necessarily all going to be on board doing that. Um, there would be editorials. At one point, outsiders got a letter signed by retired astronauts saying this was the right path. Asking questions when others were speaking about it. There's always you know, we do have to be responsive to the public and the voice that is given because of the space movement was very, very important. I was not only speaking to the industry that was making money off these contracts, but people were coming to these events and asking good questions and even just seeing people in the audience when you needed to nodding and coming up afterwards. Right. <laughs> and giving you a hug and whispering in your ear, you got this, you know, we're with you. That, that meant a lot. Okay. I'm going to replay that one real quick. Even if it, when you get off stage, there's always a line of people that want to come over and they want to tell you that they love you or they want to act, they want to pitch their idea to you or whatever. But one of the things that was particularly valuable to you was those people that would just come by and give you a nod or would catch you afterwards and just say keep it up well done well and of course i mean i i knew them and i could also get them assigned to things something that gosh it's overlooked a lot but the augustine committee we came in with and they were absolutely a critical step in getting this policy because here were these you know top of their field people who acknowledged that commercial space was the way to transport astronauts in the future and when Dr. Sally Ride told me they had all agreed to that, I, I knew that one of the people who was absolutely critical in making that happen was Jeff Grayson. Well, Jeff, we had gotten appointed to the committee. I knew I could get one. I had shot to get one person that was not from, you know, the, the typical traditional bureaucracy. And he was just the perfect person. He was technical. He was credible and he made his arguments in a way that others could see them. Like these are all really important people along the way. And having Jeff there as the Augustine committee is briefing and you're looking at him and you're knowing we are in sync on this. Those are, those are really important moments. And the last thing you want to do is leave people like that hanging. I was representing, you know, it was, uh, there's so many analogies that are funny, but you know, not many people who've grown up with these communities get to a role like that. You know, Scott Pace is another one. And Scott and I have talked about these things. You know, Scott also came from the National Space Society. He didn't 
take as much as I did, I guess, from the commercial elements because he, I, I thought, sort of went to the dark side a bit when in the policy world. But I know we all know what he really really believes and everybody has a master and he had worked for Mike Griffin who felt that the government needs its own systems. Hey, it's a, it's a, it's an argument to have. Yeah. It's a debate. Honest people can disagree. So yeah, I, I really could have written whole chapters on the support from the movement. And I do know that a lot of times they had, had taken hits and Ben Malign, but they'd also recruited people like Newt Gingrich as a freshman congressman who he believed in everything we believed in. There was a George Brown, the Democrat leader of the science committee back in the 80s, sponsored the Space Settlement Act. These weren't nothing. They didn't amount to much on their own, but over time, they built up to a point where when I was in there, um, enough Again, the sort of they tilled the soil, planted the seeds, been watered, fertilized, and we're starting to grow. And so that community, and, and this is, I think, a real critical thing for people today to understand, is there were a lot of, it wasn't a single institution that took on this mantle and said, let's do it. It was a, it was individuals not companies, individuals that were really driving this change and a loose collaboration, mostly. It sounds like it was, if it's dinners and things like that, it's it's understanding, it's a real politic, I guess, right? Like, Yeah, you know, very loose, other than once I was appointed to lead the transition team, I was able to select a small team George Whitesides, most notably, who had been executive okay. director of the National Space Society after me, he and I got to work right away before even the election. It's all secret then. And if your candidate doesn't win, it's never announced. But but early on, we had done the work, written this up, we're ready with what we wanted to propose. And I was working the transition team on the larger side. The Obama team was led by Tom Wheeler, for instance. He ran all the science and technology agency transition teams. And he was easy to convince of this. He had his background. He became the chair of the FCC. So commercial things, doing, working with the private sector, these were all very easy concepts and recognizing that you want to leverage the government's investment. So having a combination of insiders like that within the Obama political leadership helped as well. Is that untowards or unseemly or somehow, because there, there some people have a framework that says, oh, you're wall and you're not supposed to talk to people. And I obviously don't have that opinion, but did you find that there were people in government service that thought it was a bad thing to talk to people outside the building? There might have been some, okay. but it's again, sort of in my background, like I'm very well versed on the fact that that is, you're there representing the people. It would be yeah. weird not to talk to them. And I'm a big believer in no one person can know yeah. everything. And the secret shouldn't be any secret. It's all about people. You bring together smart people and listen to them and take those ideas forward. That's all I did. That's all I did. And finding the smart people who can take them the next step. And for people in your workforce, being able to fuel them with, you know, the um, support they need to take those ideas for further where my challenge came was when there were people who just nonsensically to me didn't want to follow the guidance we were given by the administration when we were part of the administration. Yeah. Uh, that's what's unseemly, frankly. Yeah. Looking to the outside is is the whole point. I considered my jobs when I have been in government just a huge responsibility to represent the public. And the non-vested public, non-vested interest public is is probably going to give you better advice on this than those who stand to make a buck off a certain yeah. way you're going. So I think it. I really felt like 
I was getting criticized for doing something unseemly by the people who were actually doing things that were unseemly. Many people who yeah. fought very hard for these parts of consolation to be reestablished went then from government and worked for industry for clearly probably twice as much as they were making the government. That is unseemly. And I, I asked the question mainly to tease out for folks who will get a chance to maybe listen to this and be aware that how our current state of the industry was formed was not through just RFIs and responding to SBIRs and things like that. It, there is much more to it and your ability to communicate and exchange ideas and working with that community is one of the things that enabled you and all the other people to be successful. Newer entrants into this industry may not have that same idea and may may believe that it has to be more formal. So, and well, as I think you know, there, there comes a time when it does have to be more formal. Yes. And, and once RFIs and RFPs and th things are presented, there are legitimate rules that I more than followed because I believe very strongly, you know, when everybody's against you, they're going to use any little thing possible against you. So we couldn't make any missteps. Yeah. And I, I know I upset some my friends who worked in these companies, for instance, when the, we had the competition over Pad 39A and SpaceX and Blue were both bidding. And I'd had friends, I think on the blue side, calling and I couldn't return the call and didn't talk to them until it was over. And they were furious. Like, no, you didn't want me to do that. You wouldn't have you wanted do, me to call yeah. you. And, you know, yeah. yeah, we're friends. Yeah, we're friends. But you also work there. And I'm not on the source selection committee. So, yeah. It's, it's not technically illegal, but it's it's not the it's not a good no. look. No, yeah, yeah, that, absolutely. Uh, tell me, a lot of enthusiasts in this industry. How did you navigate and choose to engage with maybe some of the more extreme crazies uh, in our fine industry? Like, and and I mean that because all of us at some point might be that crazy. But like, what was your? How did you figure out where to place your time and which crazies did you talk to yeah i i i would guess that my level on the crazy scale modified over time i learned to embrace the crazy i have learned to embrace the crazy over time i think early on of course you're you're early in your career although i was very much enchanted with the l5 society's energy and intellectual integrity. Sure, some of those advocates maybe weren't the most presentable in a Washington party circuit. One of my friends at NASA actually referred to me throughout my time at NASA as Wendy. So Wendy is a reference, I think, or maybe it's Marilyn, to like the normal looking character in the Munsters or the Adams uh, family okay, yeah. and all the other family are like, monsters but they they treat her like oh you poor girl you look so plain and but but i fit in with the outside world so i was a crazy who could jump the Pass. shark yeah. and work yeah. at nasa and work for the term and fit in and oh i i i spoke traditional aerospace i had a space policy degree and could go to parties and but the truth is i think crazy is something that is it's just not a, a real problem you have people who are very smart with excellent views and we we shouldn't discount anybody over how how we think they might present themselves so uh i get the question and i really feel like there there is certain a libertarian element in the l5 society and so I was working in Washington, D.C. my whole career. So, of course, that is viewed as an outsider, like, oh, mm. you know, they don't even want government. Well, I grew up in Michigan with a Republican family who believed very much in limited government. And that wasn't, to me, that radical of, of an idea. And, of course, the government was never going to pay for us to create a space of civilization. We had to find an economic pull, a driver market for these things in order to lower the cost. Those are all things that maybe it takes some level of an eccentric person to really make happen. Yep. Yeah. Whole Overton, moving the Overton window uh, of what's allowed to be 
discussed. Uh, let me um, let me poke a few other quick things here. I know our time is limited. Where did the movement go too far or overplay their hand or risk becoming complacent through wins? Or like, is there anything that you see right now that's like, okay, here were things where we might have over exaggerated or we risk going too far? Again, that probably shifts over time. There were people who thought, why why would we get so involved in something like the Moon Treaty argument? Well, that that was important. And the people who did it should be, and I'm sure are proud of that. We, in our testimony over those early years in the 80s and 90s, again, I have reviewed it so thoughtful. And I can say this because I was usually delivering it, but I didn't necessarily write it. People who did that, like Scott Pace, Mark Hopkins, who recently passed away, Glenn Reynolds, who's Instapundit now. You know, these these were sound ideas. Newt Gingrich was somebody who liked to give the most radical approach. And so that was maybe sometimes just because it was him later on seen as an outlier and something to push back on. I don't I don't think what really I think the pushback started being a bigger problem when we really started succeeding. And today, of course, we have the issue of the billionaires. And I think it's unfortunate that we are so often now tying space development to the billionaires because there is a natural backlash, some of it deserved against them as individuals. And that's quite different than the companies that they formed where we know there's thousands of people working to do good things. I think right now I'm somewhat not thrilled with the let's fight over which of these companies we like better. I'm known as someone who thought it was not a good public policy decision to build the SLS in Orion. I will stand by that because it was tens of billions of dollars for so long that took us off a path where we could have incentivized, I think, lowering the costs sooner of some of these things. But really to argue over which of the rockets is better other than as a public policy decision because that's long past let's let's let economics sort this out let's let technical success work this out i think that's fair but i'm also somebody who's not super conflict averse as you you might guess and so a little conflict that's that's okay so uh, i'll ask this as the the last one um as we're talking about the space frontier foundation picking up the legacy of all of the work from l5 and nss and you and all of these these people that have moved us forward what are some of the things okay i'm sure there's some great high you know well we should be focused on these sort of economic programs but what are the sort of things that would be the support for this industry, the, the the new version of the community that you drew upon, what are some things that you would recommend that we do now in order to build on the work that you've done? I think there has been so much positive development in the area of organizations supporting space activities. And I don't even like to call it the space program because that's not really what it is. And so you get these groups like Space for Humanity. Um, there's, of course, several Mars-focused groups, groups where the lawyers are looking at the treaties and regulatory environment. That's all really important and takes me back to a story I simply must tell for this show because I remember the conversation that Rick Tumlins and I had when he decided to start the Space Frontier Foundation, and he was nervously telling me. So by now, I'm the executive director of the National Space Society. Oh, okay. Ooh, big time. And he was a board member. And really, the merger, while it had taken place, the staff had merged. We had chapter leaders who were board members. It was There was still tension between the activist side and the more traditional side. And Rick really felt that we were not an activist enough organization. And that's, I think he can tell you in his own words, but as he related to me, he felt it was time to start a more activist group and he wasn't doing it 
to disavow NSS. And he wanted me to know that. And my reaction at the time, again, I remember the conversation was, I think that is a wonderful thing to do. Maybe a bit of it was, yeah, you know, I'm trying to testify before Congress. I'm trying to keep NSS in these things. I was appointed to the NASA advisory board. Like I'm trying to be Wendy or Marilyn or whatever that woman's name is. And that's fine to have more groups. We had often talked about, we wanted to be like the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. And I said, just think if like the wildlife federation didn't think we should have a Sierra club, we, you know, you don't get to do that. And by the way, they're stronger because they have hundreds, probably thousands of environmental groups and the space movement as we mature can follow that model. I was never this, oh, we need to keep everybody. And groups have grown up around what used to be. National Space Society was one of the first starting in 74. Planetary Society came along later. The Space Foundation, I was at their conference a few months ago. And, you know, it's just amazing what's taken place, each with a niche. And my funny comment Drick was, no, if we're like the environmental movement, you guys can be the earth firsters. I don't know if they're still around, but they were the ones sticking spikes in the trees to, you know, cookbook or something like that. Yeah, that was the, yeah. (laughs) And, you know, I probably didn't want to work for them at the time. (laughs) I later, maybe you have more of a sparks in the trees girl, but spikes in the trees. But I, I think that was an absolutely positive development as we continued. And there have been so many. So I would say, in answer to your question, that path we're on is a good one. I do really think there needs to be more focus on sort of our laws and regulatory environment. Often technologies precede our ability to manage society within them, but we are there and it is limiting. It is going to limit our advancement if we don't get some of those established. And that's where I think I have a bit more concern with the billionaires because it causes different types of communities to say, wait, I don't I don't want these individuals deciding what the space frontier is going to look like. And that's the, you know, you can understand why there's that hesitancy. And in the beginning, when we were proposing things along the lines of how, you know, we had moved west with we had lunar purchase act language and so forth it it was less controversial but that's what we need now that we're going to be having these tools to go these places is the ability to say to the public oh don't worry we're not we're not going to mess with these things to the extent we're going to hurt society these are all things to help those of us who remain on earth to help the environment here. I don't know a single space group that doesn't also have an environmental earth centric agenda. I think that's yep. really positive. And I like seeing that within the Space Frontier Foundation, you know, being a, adopted as well as a focus on diversity, a focus on recognizing we don't all have to have a cookie cutter approach to this and different people from different backgrounds are what make us stronger. And that community, for me, as I came into the industry, Space Frontier Foundation was home. Like there were plenty of other places that I went, but when I was with, I was at the conference or with other people from the foundation, it felt like even though I wasn't a space guy, it felt like home to me. And it sounds like you had a similar sort of group that felt like home that wasn't necessarily inside the beltway, which is phenomenal. And hopefully we'll be able to keep doing that for more people to come. Yeah. And it's just so important. You know, I didn't grow up around DC. As I said, I grew up in Michigan. And I remember when I moved here after college and my family said, you know, keep in mind that really isn't where it all happens. And they urged me to continue to subscribe to things like the Detroit Free Press to see what real people care about. Mm -hmm. And I think that does ground you. And again, when, especially you're in government, when I was at the National Space Society, my constituency was those 30,000 members each paying 30 bucks and it was easy to represent them and, and their views. But when you work for NASA, it's really the public that has a much broader agenda. And so we had to do things that I felt would really benefit the public. And I 
I just, there's no question that what we do in space does, if it's done in a way that maximizes that, all the better. Lori, thank you so much. To anyone who is watching this, make sure you read the book twice even, or you can even listen to it because you read your own book. So thank you for doing that. So it actually was your own voice, which is phenomenal. Thank you for all that you've done and for the insight that you're providing for those of us who are trying to bring more folks into the, the right way of thinking about space. Again, thank you for having me. It's good to be with you.